Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Davar Bonacci. I'm a software engineer at Google, and I'm serving as a, a chair of the project management committee for Apache Beam. And today, I'm going to give you an introduction to Apache Beam. So first, let's give a quick uh, intro. So Apache Beam is an open source project for expressing both batch and streaming data processing use cases. So when you use Beam, you are focusing on your logic and your data without letting the details of the underlying engine leak through into your code. And that separation allows the same Beam pipeline to run on multiple edge engines without uh, any modification. And those engines include Apache Spark, Apache Flink, Apache Apex, Google Cloud Dataflow, and several coming up. So it kind of, if I were to summarize Apache Beam, I usually use this sentence. And this sentence kind of captures uh, the, the vision of the project. Apache Beam is a unified programming model designed to provide efficient and portable data processing pipelines. And these three things are key. Unified, efficient, and portable. So unified really means that we can cover a broad range of use cases from batch to streaming or anywhere in between in one single unified API. Efficient really means it runs really well, really, really fast. And then portable means it can run anywhere. So these three things are three key characteristics of Apache Beam. And in today's talk, I'm going to focus on two of them, unified and portable. I won't be talking about, uh, much about efficiency, but like if you're interested in the efficiency part of the story, I would encourage you to look uh, at a talk that happened at this same venue last year when, when, when we discussed uh, efficiency in much more detail. So looking over the talk, I'm going to uh, divide it in, a, in a several sections. So recently we had a, a, a major milestone achieved. That is the first table release uh, of the project. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what, has, what the project has gone through to get to this point. And then we are going to uh, dive into unified model. So we'll look how we can express data processing pipelines with the Beam model. Then we go back to portability and then uh, explain the Beam vision of portability. And then look at a very uh, specific use case. Right? This is not the only talk about Apache Beam at this conference. So if you like this talk and if you like this content, I would encourage you to come later today at 3 o'clock uh, just a across the hall over here, where uh, Ken Knowles from Google will talk about one specific part of the B model, and that is how to talk about uh, uh, stateful processing uh, with Apache Beam. And then tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock, we'll have a birds of a feather session where various things uh, and various projects related to streaming will come together and we'll have an open, frank discussion about various things in this space. So if you're interested, in that, I would encourage you to come uh, tomorrow at 5 o'clock. With that, let's look at uh, uh, where the Beam project is right now and what uh, we accomplished in starting the project. So the project was started back in February 2016, so basically a year and a half ago, when Google uh, and a few other partners joined together and donated uh, this code base to the Apache Software Foundation and the project enter Apache incubation. About half a year later, uh, the project came to its first release. Basically, all the refactorings that needed to be done have been done, and that resulted in the first release. Another half a year later, the project uh, went through the you know, uh, community growth, which resulted in graduation as a top-level uh, project at the Apache Software Foundation. That happened uh, half a year ago. And since then, the project and the entire community worked hard on stabilizing the API surface, which resulted last month in the uh, availability of the first table release. So the first table release uh, is really a statement from the community that it, it tends to maintain API compatibility for the foreseeable future. It's really a statement that Beam is ready for deployment in enterprise settings, right? Nobody really wants uh, to be required to change their pipelines because somebody changed some API. And this kind of is the guarantee and the compatibility that the community is guaranteeing from this point onwards 
for the foreseeable future. And this is kind of a, a, a great milestone that the community has achieved and we, are, we in, at Apache Beam are very proud of our accomplishments right here. So with that, let's look a little bit about portability, and uh, sorry, uh, about the unified model and see how uh, Beam model can express data processing pipelines uh, very efficiently across a wide variety of use cases. So if we are going to build uh, a unified model and if we are going to support batch and streaming at the same time, the really key difference that we have to understand is the separation between event time and processing time. So event time is the time the event actually occurred, and processing time is the time our system got a chance to process that element. And due to various effects, processing time is often later than the actual event time. In the ideal system, all the events would appear on this diagonal line indicating that all of them are processed exactly at the moment they have happened. However, due to various effects of delays in the network and delivery and fault tolerance, events happen to be processed uh, much later. So I'm going to use a running example of a pipeline. L uh, so let's assume that we are building a mobile game and these events uh, on this diagram represent scores that our players have achieved. So if you look at this uh, element number three that represents a score of three points that a user uh, uh, got. And that event happened like uh, around 12.06 in this diagram. And this de event wasn't delayed much. It was processed around you know, uh, 12.07. Right? So our system got the chance to process it relatively uh, soon after it happened. But if you look at this element number nine, uh, so this actually occurred around 1201, and our system got the chance to process it seven minutes later. You know, maybe uh, our player played it in an elevator or in a garage, and there was no uh, good connectivity there, so only after a few minutes, our system got the chance to process this element. So this element number nine is delayed much more than this element number three. So these uh, kinds of uh, uh, processing is relatively hard to reason about. And to, to be able to do that, uh, Beam model is based on a four different questions. And the Beam API is separating these four concerns into four separate APIs so that we can reason about this relatively effectively. So the first question is what results are being calculated? So are we doing sums, joins, histograms, machine learning, or something like that? This is our business logic. The second question is where in event time are results calculated? How does the time the event originally happened affect our results? The third question is when in processing time are results materialized? So basically this is how much the uh, elements delay affect the results that we are going to produce. And then finally, if we produce multiple results uh, for a given slice of time, how do those refinements relate to each other? So let's look at this uh, on a running example. So let's say that we are trying, that we still have this our, our mobile game and the users are achieving some scores. Let's say that users belong to a team and that we are interested in computing a leaderboard for the team. So each team score is some of the scores of individual uh, members of the team. So this is a one-line pipeline uh, that has an input. Uh, input is a uh, you know, input collection. We apply a transformation to it. The transformation in this case is very simple. We are summing integers per key. In this case, key is the team. So we basically, we are summing integers or scores that the members of the team have achieved. And the result is a key value pair of team and the score of the team. So this is a pretty simple pipeline. We are just summing scores. Okay, so let's see what happens if we were to execute this pipeline uh, on our running example, right? So on, on this animation, we see processing. As the processing time goes on, our system encounters elements and we are summing them. And after the entire processing has finished, we have processed all of the input data, we uh, emit the result, and the result in this case is 51. So this 
is a running example of a real batch pipeline, really traditional standard batch pipeline. We are going over the input elements. Once we process all of them, we output the result. Right. So let's start building our pipeline towards a streaming, a real-time system. So the first thing that we would need is if the system is going to be real-time, it can't process all of the data at once, especially of, uh, assuming the, uh, the input is infinite. Right? So we will have to slice the event time into chunks. And we do that with the concept of windowing. So we are doing a one-line transformation to the previous pipeline that tells the system to window the input into fixed windows of duration of two minutes. Okay? So let's see what happens to the same animation as we had before. So first thing that's different is that instead of one result being produced, we have multiple of them. Right? We have four results being emitted for four distinct slices of event time. So instead of 51, we have 14, 22, 3, and 12. Okay? This isn't really a real-time system just yet. Right? We do have multiple results for different slices of event time, but the results are produced only after the processing time went to infinity, after we have processed all of the input. So we are producing multiple results, just those results are materialized at the end of processing. So let's start building further. Let's answer the third question in the B model, and that is when in processing time are results materialized. And we do that with the concept of a trigger. With this one line code change, we are teaching the system to produce the results for each window at the moment the system believes it has seen all the data for that window. Okay? Very simple one line change. And at this point, we have build something that is a real-time system. So this squiggly line that appeared on this uh, animation represents the watermark. It represents the system's belief what data it has seen by that moment. And when that line passes the end of each window, the system emits the result for that window. Right? And in this case of these four windows uh, drawn here, we see that system was right three times. But in the first window, there was that element number nine, uh, the score of nine, that was delayed mo much more than other elements. And in this case, the system didn't expect the element to be delayed this much. And the system made a mistake. So it produced three correct results for three later windows, but the first window, the result appears inaccurate, right? The, the system's heuristic, the system estimate was too fast, okay? So let's solve this problem. So first thing that we have to realize is that the system can never be sure that it has seen all the data. The, the, there has to be a, a heuristic. The system has to, at some point, produce the results. But the real benefit of Beam is that even when a late data happens, even when the system is incorrect, the system get out, can get out of this situation. So we are going to make like one or two line change to our running example and modify the trigger to teach the system to, in addition to producing the result for each window, when the system believes it, can see that it has seen the data for that window, we'll tell the system that every time we see a late element, we produce a correction, an update, into the result for that window. And just to make things a little bit more complicated, we'll do one more thing. We'll ask the system to produce early results, incomplete results, speculative results, for every one minute uh, of processing time. So now, after this case, we'll see multiple results for each window, and then we have to thank the system that they relate to each other in the accumulating mode. So this is, uh, again, one or two line change to our pipeline. And this is the resulting system and how it behaves. So now we see that for the first window, we still have that 
uh, on time result of five at, the, at uh, emitted at 12.06 when the system believed that this is correct result for the first window. And then a correction of 14, a late result after the element nine was discovered and the correction for that window. In addition to that, in the second window, in addition to the result 22, we see two early results every minute at 12.06 and 12.07, and then a little bit later, the on-time result of 22. So with this system, we can build, uh, so this is a relatively complex streaming pipeline that produces the results the system thinks are correct for each window. It, it corrects the results if the system happened to be incorrect, but in addition to that, produces early results so that our downstream system can see where our results are tracking towards. And this is a really powerful concept uh, and a really complex streaming pipeline that we were able to build in just a few lines of code. So to summarize this section, you know, we took an algorithm. In this case, it was just summing integers. And we were able to take that algorithm and run it in a variety of scenarios, from a simple batch case to a, a pretty complex streaming system, right? And that's the power of the unified model. But in addition to that, for each of these cases, we had to modify a typically one line of code. But, you know, that may be not much compared to the complexity of the underlying algorithm that was just summing integers. But the same story would fly, and the same story would be true, however complicated and however big the business logic may be. It will still be one line change to run in any of these scenarios, regardless of the complexity of the business logic. We saw it on summing integers, but it can be training machine learning models. It would still stand. This story would still stand. And that's the power of the Beam Unified Model. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about portability and the Beam vision for portability. And that can be summarized in a sentence, write once, run anywhere. So at the core of Beam, at the heart of Beam, is the Beam model. But the model is something conceptual. It, it's, uh, it, it's a spec. It's a spec to say you know, how things execute by answering these four questions we saw before. The, the Beam model is realized in a set of SDKs. So basically, users of Beam have the choice of taking a SDK in Java, or taking an SDK in Python, or more SDKs coming up. Basically, uh, we don't want to force users to use one set of APIs. We really want to meet them where they are, and uh, reach out to every community uh, who, who wants to use this kind of functionality. And then on the lower end are the Beam runners. So once the pipeline is defined in an SDK, a runner can take that pipeline and run it on its own system. And we are not giving any preference to any runners, and the users can free to choose their runtime based on their current needs. It can be on-premise or in the cloud, it can be open source or not, it can be fully managed or not. So kind of any, ki uh, any kind of engine is uh, it's possible to connect with Beam. And today, uh, Beam supports Apache Spark, Apache Flink, Apache Apex, and Google Cloud Airflow. And then the, the final part of the, uh, of the Beam vision is the scalability for developers. Right? We don't really want to write a runner for every SDK. Right, that would be uh, really cost prohibitive. So kind of we have the portability framework that allows runners to connect to different SDKs even if they are written in different languages and do, do so efficiently. Right? So that is the Beam vision. However, visions are a journey and the real state of the Beam project is slightly different than the vision. So today we have the Java SDK and the Java SDK runs on all of the runners that we have. On the other hand, uh, upcoming the Python SDK runs only on a subset of runners today. And we are working uh, very hard to address that uh, deficiency and finishing up the cross-language infrastructure uh, in the coming months. So let's look a little bit deeper into uh, some of the runners that, that Beam supports. So Apache Spark needs no introduction, I think. 
uh, it's a popular choice today um, in the big data world. It really excels at in-memory and interactive computations. Apache Flink is the second uh, very popular runner. It's more of a newcomer, but it has really powerful streaming semantics. And then Google Cloud Dataflow is a Google Cloud service uh, uh, that is fully managed and can run Beam pipelines uh, very efficiently. So how do I think about Apache Beam? Kind of, w what is Apache Beam trying to do? And I usually uh, use the analogy uh, with, with other programming languages. So, you know, before Java came about, we had C, C++, and, and similar languages. Once you compile them, they run on the operating system you compile them on. Right? You couldn't compile it on Windows and take it to Linux or other way around. And then Java came along. Java raised the level of abstraction, introduced bytecode, and now the same program could run on multiple operating systems. It can run on phones and tablets. And Java's portability really enabled that scenario. Similarly, it, it, this is similar how I think about Beam. Beam is raising the level of abstraction, abstracting underlying engines, uh, and allowing the same pipeline to run on multiple engines. And the same thing was actually true across the uh, you know, history of computer science that you know, uh, level of abstraction has been raised further and further, and uh, Microsoft.net is another example of, of a very similar concept. If you really think about other cases where operating systems are abstracting the underlying hardware and things like that, you see that this concept of raising the level of abstraction holds uh, for many decades. So let's look a little bit deeper about how do we really build an abstraction layer. All right, let's say that we have a three runners in this case. How do we really connect them to each other? So maybe one thing uh, or one approach in doing so is to try to make an in intersection of runner functionality. Right? Uh, so this wouldn't stand much. Right? It would be too limited. Uh, some runners excel at streaming. Some runners excel at batch. By trying to do an intersection of all of them may not uh, be particularly viable. Maybe another alternative would be the union and try to expose through Beam each of the underlying functionality of the system. That would be more kind of a kitchen sink of a functionality and probably would not be uh, a very attractive offering. Right? So uh, the philosophy in how we are designing Beam is that we really want to be at the forefront of where data processing is going. And we do that by interacting uh, with each underlying engine, and we try to pull data processing patterns out of the each engine and push features inside each of the engines. And you know, this cycle, I think, excels us uh, uh, in improving both Beam and uh, uh, runners themselves. So I'll give a few examples of where this was true. So uh, I'll talk about keyed state. Heat state is a, f a feature that existed in Flink, for example, uh, for a while, but it was not part of the Beam model until recently. And this was an example of Beam taking a, uh, patterns out of the runner and exposing it across the board. On the other hand, uh, Beam is pushing features inside each of the runners. And again, I can uh, take Flink as, uh, as an example where uh, Flink APIs are heavily influenced by Beam and Dataflow model. But wait a minute, right? If the runners are not equal, if you are not the intersection of runner capability, can each pipeline run on every runner? The answer is sort of. There are cases where uh, it's not true that every pipeline can run on every runner. Right? Some runners can do batch, some runners can do streaming, some runners are better for one kind of use case and worse for the other. But every pipeline can run on multiple runners. Right? Not all pipelines can run on all runners, but every pipeline can run on multiple runners. And we are trying to be very, forf uh, very explicit about it, so we are categorizing runner capabilities in a thing called capability matrix, and we try to keep this uh, matrix up to date. Uh, this screenshot may be a few months out of date. So with those concepts behind us, let's look at a use case. Let's look at a practical 
example, a real pipeline with some screenshots. I won't do a live demo. Uh, public Wi-Fi is live demos. Uh, SSH tunnels to clouds are not particularly uh, advisable, so I'll, I'll show you this in a, in a series of screenshots. So this is a pipeline uh, written in Beam. This is the main method of a Java program. So kind of we are constructing a pipeline first by reading some input from a text file. Then we are parsing each line of the text file. Then we are applying timestamps to each element, right? That's the, that's the third line there. Then we are windowing this into fixed windows of one hour. And then we are calculating team scores. So this is kind of the full pipeline that we have been talking about before, right? We are just reading it from the text file, parsing, assigning timestamps, windowing, and then calculating team scores uh, for each team, right? And then I'm going to look into parse event function. It's a simple do function that is reading every line, separating the line based on commas. So this is a comma separated uh, input file. And then we are trying to read those, uh, uh, those elements. And then if we encounter a parse error, we are incrementing a counter, right? Simple as that. Looking at calculate team scores, uh, we are assigning keys based on the team, we are summing integers, and then uh, we are writing those, uh, that output to a file, right? Simple as that. So this is a screenshot of that pipeline, exactly as it is, running on Google Cloud Dataflow. So on the left side, you can see a pipeline in a graphical form exactly as you have described it in your code with text IO read and parsing and setting timestamps. On the right, you can see some uh, information about that pipeline, so it was ra ran on March 10th. It took 10 minutes to run, uh, and you know it produced results. If we click on a text.io.read, we can look more in more details what, how much data we have processed. And this pipeline was run on 102 gigabytes of data. So this, this isn't particularly a lot, but it isn't a toy example either. So it was about one billion rows uh, uh, in that file. Right, looking deeper, uh, Dataflow UI gives you an ability to uh, dig deeper and show kind of the logical organization of your pipeline. So, you know, looking deeper into the parse, we can see that uh, the, we failed to parse about 1,000 of the events. So uh, that was uh, in inserted intentionally into, into the input data. Now let's look at that same exact pipeline running in Spark. And this is a screenshot of that exact pipeline running in Spark with the Spark UI. So Spark UI gives you a similar visualization. It just shows you more details regarding the execution. So we see that Spark executed this same pipeline in three stages, uh, which is exactly what we would expect it to do. If we look at stage zero, we see exact same things appear. Text IO dot read, parse events, and things like that, set timestamps, exactly as we described it in our Beam program. You know, looking further uh, into the Spark UI, we see multiple metrics, we see how much each uh, pipeline has took. This, is, uh, this data is, for example, unique to Spark UI. Uh, looking further, we see uh, more profiling data about the pipeline. Uh, looking at the runtime, these are uh, popular Spark Gantt charts where we can see uh, how much it took. Now this is exact same pipeline running in, in Flink UI. Flink UI visualizes the pipeline slightly differently, but again we can recognize the same things we did before. There is text IO, there, uh, there is uh, grouping into fixed windows. We see exact same number of parse errors, you know, uh, 1,366 uh, because it was run on the same, same input data. Right, uh, looking, drilling further into the Flink UI, we see about the same number of records, one billion, 109 gigabytes of input data. So this is exact same pipeline, same input data, uh, no change written in the Flink UI. Now I'm going to show you a little bit further. Let's say that I have changed my input source not to be a text file and change the input source to be a Google Cloud PubSub. So that's a streaming uh, source that is infinite and can stream messages into our pipeline uh, infinitely. So we are basically just modifying text IO and replacing it with PubSub IO. Everything else is roughly the same. We are modifying a little bit of triggering to, similarly as I showed you before, to produce early results, to produce 
uh, on-time results and to produce uh, late uh, corrections for any late element. And then otherwise, calculate team scores has not changed in any way compared to the batch pipeline. Now I can show you the same pipeline running in the data flow UI. Again, this uh, screenshot was taken in March. Uh, PubSub IO now appears instead of a text IO in that same screenshot. And then uh, this pipeline was running for about 20 hours when, when this uh, screenshot was taken. Right, so hopefully this gives you kind of a feeling how uh, Apache Beam looks like, how is it to use it. And if you'd like to get started on our website, we have uh, Java SDK, Quick Start, Python SDK, Quick Start, example walkthroughs for word count, which is a pretty simple example, and the mobile gaming, which is pieces of which I did, uh, demonstrated today. But on the, on the website, you can see much more detail and much more steps into building, uh, for example, a mobile game backend with Apache Beam. All right. With that out of the way, let's talk a little bit about what this portability can turn into and how this portability can turn into extensibility and how that extensibility can integrate the big data ecosystem. So in the previous section, I showed you kind of right ones run anywhere. With extensibility, really, we are turning that into anything, run anything on, an, on any engine, right? Anything, anywhere. So we talked a little bit so far about SDKs and runners, right? Those are two major extensibility points in Apache Beam. But these are not all extensibility points that we have. And then we have four more extensibility points for domain-specific extensions, libraries of transformations, IOs, and file systems. And when you put all these things together, uh, Apache Beam can connect uh, different systems together. So let's look at it a little bit. So this is kind of a recap. Uh, in Beam, we have multiple SDKs. And today, we have two, Java and Python. If you look at the runners, runners execute a pipeline written in any SDK. And today, we have four runners, Apache Apex, Apache Flink, Apache Spark, and Google Cloud Airflow. But in addition to that, uh, due to various community contributions, we have in-progress runners for Apache Gear Pump, for JSTORM, uh, and for uh, Spark 2.0 and Structured Streaming with some uh, additional runners uh, being investigated as we speak. Now let's look at domain-specific extensions. Right? One of the criticism people tell about Beam is it's too complex. It can do too many things. It's too generic. And that's exactly right, and that's exactly how it was designed to be. Right? But if, if a particular community doesn't need the full power of the Beam model, our solution to that is the DSL, kind of domain-specific extension, domain-specific language, where Beam SDK can be adapted to a particular community. Let that be, you know, data analysts, data scientists, that can be, you know, any kind of uh, genomics community, any kind of community that really needs the power of big data. So with a DSL on top of an SDK, we can adapt uh, the pipeline construction to be done, for example, in the UI with uh, graphical tools, or the pipeline be sp uh, specified in an XML format or in a YAML format, or, you know, in any way a particular community desires uh, uh, to interact with a big data system. And today, there is one major DSL written uh, on top of Beam, and uh, it's for Scala language, and it's called Shio. It uh, exists outside of the Beam project, but it is, you know, fully-fledged DSL uh, that can execute their code on any runner. And then we have another DSL in progress, which is a SQL-based DSL that is based on the great work that uh, is occurring in the Apache call site community. All right, and this is really how Beam can meet users where they are. Irrespective of their uh, experience level, irrespective of how they want to interact with the system. Now let's look at the next extensibility point that's it's a library of transformation. So kind of Beam can be used to orchestrate a bigger process, right? So let's say that, uh, you know, we have a system that can do something really well. 
you know, let's say that that could be machine learning. Typically, if you want to use machine learning, you need some kind of data preparation step, data cleansing, some kind of adapt, adapting the data for your system. And Beam can be used to orchestrate that kind of workload. Right? And that is uh, the extensibility point for libraries of transformation. And what we have right now uh, in the Beam ecosystem is the uh, such library for TensorFlow. Right, so TensorFlow is obviously a very popular machine learning system. TensorFlow through, can be packaged as a transformation in Beam, as one step of the Beam pipeline, and then through Beam, a lot of things can be orchestrated and prepared, data for TensorFlow, and then used later on. Then the next uh, uh, extensibility point is the extensibility point for uh, for I.O. connectors, right? Uh, obviously, every pipeline needs some data to read and somewhere to write. And in Beam, we have a support for about 20 different systems, and the most popular systems are included there. Additionally, we support a connector to uh, Apache Hadoop input format, and then everything that is read read readable in Hadoop can be re uh, uh, read in Beam as well, right? And then finally, we support multiple file systems. Uh, and you know, some, of, some of those examples are uh, HDFS, S3, Azure, Google Cloud Storage, and others. All right, so really the point of this section is that Apache Beam can serve to integrate the ecosystem. So if you have an engine, I, I you know, suggest people to write a Beam runner. By doing so, you can meet your users where they are. You know, all the Beam SDKs and all of the Beam DSLs can run on your engine. If you want to extend Beam to new languages, sure, write an SDK. Th those users can run anywhere then. Or if you want to adapt an SDK to a target audience, it, that can be packaged as a Beam DSL. And then your users, again, can run anywhere. Or if you have a component that can be part of a bigger pipeline, that can be packaged as a library of transformation, and that then can run on any runner. And then finally, if you have a data storage or messaging system, you can use uh, Beam uh, with an I.O. connector or a file system connector to get the data into your system or out of your system. And that those users can again be not limited to any SDK or any runner. And that's a benefit for everyone. So kind of the summary of this is that Apache Beam can be used as a glue that integrates the big data ecosystem together. If you'd like to learn more and get involved, of course, visit our website, join our mailing list, follow us on Twitter, and uh, yeah, join the community, and we, that we can you know, together push forward the state of the art uh, in distributed data processing. If you like, so one more recap. If you take out one thing from this talk, that would be this sentence, Apache Beam is the Unified programming model designed to provide efficient and portable data processing pipelines. Unified, efficient, and portable. If you'd like to learn more, there's a session again at 3 o'clock just across the hall uh, with one specific use case of Beam. And of course, open discussion, birds of a feather session tomorrow at 5 o'clock. Thank you. Go ahead. No extra infrastructure needed. So this would run on a native Flink, on a native Spark, in Google Cloud Dataflow, no extra setup needed. If you have a cluster that runs Spark jobs, this same cluster can run Beam jobs on that cluster with no setup needed. So it's just an integration? It's, there is no engine here, right? Beam is an API. It translates things to each other. What Spark ultimately runs is a Spark pipeline, right? So no setup needed. Yes? So uh, Beam users can use Beam. So basically, we are uh, pushing out releases. Releases are uh, you know, uh, 
a Java jar, you basically link against that jar and construct your pipeline, and then you run that pipeline on a runner and that automatically submits it to the cluster. So, you know, normal use of Beam is just take a dependency on, on a Java library and you use it. And then there are other products that use Beam as a building block in a bigger product. So there are companies and doing a commercial, commercial software that you know, makes a Beam uh, available through the UI and you know, through, through various other channels. But you know, absolutely you can use it directly by just taking a dependency on a Java library. Uh, can we, uh, so we are being kicked out, so can you stay afterwards and I can answer more questions? Thank you. I also have Beam stickers. If anybody is interested, just please come by. Thank you. Thank you.